next year. Rick, yeah. Well said. Yeah, but you weren't walking, so that's how no. right. Please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Welcome to the December 7, 2015 Selectman's Meeting. We uh, are going to start with public comment. Anyone wishing public comment this evening? Please join us at the uh, podium. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to address the board. My name is John Doherty. My wife Judy and I own a property at 3 Toppin Street. We've obtained the required signatures and made a request to the board to place a warrant article on the 2016 ballot. I'm here seeking the board's uh, support for that article. Folks in town, me included, have great respect for the work that you do. Hard job requires time, commitment, much thoughtfulness. Within the town and with the voters especially, your recommendations and non-recommendations carry weight. In our article, we, we request removal of a restriction on our deed. Restriction number four relating to allowing only one single family dwelling to be placed on the lot. I understand the sensitivity surrounding removal of deed restrictions, but I submit to you that this restriction helps not one person in the town of Hampton. There are already two existing structures on the property, one of which is a failing seasonal cottage. We wish to replace this with a properly built home. This would upgrade the building and, more importantly, facilitate our relocation to Hampton. These two dwellings from a study of deed history have been on the lot a minimum of 50 years. Two dwellings on one lot is not unusual in Hampton. There's an example right across the street from ours, and both of these homes have been significantly renovated over the years with town approval. There are two current projects very, sim very similar to our request happening right now, one on Mill Road, one on Ocean Boulevard. We're respectfully asking for your support. When the time comes for the board to vote on our article and make recommendations or non, we ask that you vote favorably, favorably for it. Since there's no money involved, the board may also choose to abstain from voting on it at all. In that way, with no board recommendation, the town voters can truly decide without undue influence. Constructing a proper efficient structure in place of one of these cottages helps all concerns. There's no downside. It's a win-win-win. First, it obviously helps us because we want to we're requesting it. We want to move to Hampton. Secondly, it helps the neighborhood. Mo many of our neighbors signed the petition. I also have a written statement signed by most of the closest neighbors in support of this positive renovation. Our neighbors realize if we upgrade the property, it adds value to theirs. Thirdly, the town's helped in two ways. One, by using proper construction practice, we bring the building fully up to current code, proper building standards. Two, since our property will most certainly be reassessed following construction, we'll be paying more in taxes. We appreciate your consideration of the proposal and hope you'll consider either directly supporting it or not voting on it at all. Please feel free to drive by the property for a look. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Um, one moment. I yes. don't think we do vote on... No, we don't. Zoning articles, no. No. Not in so it's, it's not no. something that we would vote to support or not to support. Because I, we had it on the ballot last year and it was, it was voted on by the board and it was mm -hmm. not it recommended. Yeah. It was 041. But it was just for... Uh, no. Any article is not a zoning article. This is not a zoning article. Ah. It's a deed. The deed. It's, yeah. a, it's a petition warrant article. So. And what address is your address again? Three, Three Toppin. Three that one, this, one of the properties faces Ancient Highway and the other one faces Toppin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming in this evening. I appreciate Anyone it. Anyone else wishing to speak, please join us. Good evening. My name is Bill McLaughlin, 29 Hampton Town Estates. I just wanted to come in and say good things about the gentleman who just spoke. I've known John for close to 50 years. Um, he's a man of high ethical standards, uh, as high as I know of anyone. The moral and integrity issues have never been a problem with John. And I guess what I'm saying is he's not in here to develop the property and then sell it. He's here to come with his wife of 43 years to the area to build a nice home on this property. And I just believe John would be a great addition to the Hampton community. Thank you for coming Thank in you. tonight. Thank Anyone you. else wishing to speak? Mr. Chairman, yeah. I'm requesting that you indulge me to give me a couple of minutes to speak on a couple of issues. Under uh, public comment. 
Yeah, uh, yes, and then I'll try to be quickly. Over the past couple of weeks, uh, there have been many statements made which, in my opinion, question the response time and veraci veracity of answers from the town manager and the finance director. I would like to take a few minutes to clear up any confusion and would like to do so at the beginning of the meeting when we have the largest Channel 22 viewers audience. Two areas that I would like to discuss are, one, the unassigned or undesignated fund. The chair of the budget committee and individual members Jones, Anoy, and Pierce keep asking for the balance. The finance director gave the chair the balance in writing over a month ago. And both the finance director and town manager have on a number of occasions verbally given the balance to both the selectmen and the budget committee. Yet comments, unsubstantiated comments, have continued to be made that the committee has not been provided with the information. I encourage voters to go back and to watch the meetings, especially the beginning and end of the meetings, to see the comments and the criticism and the unsubstantiated things. At the December 1 meeting, it was asked what the cash balance of the undesignated fund was. The town manager tried to explain that the fund is not a cash fund. I would assume that the chair, who constantly reminds the public that she has been a committee member for a long time, and that the Zanon, Mr. Zanoy and Pierce, former selectmen, would know the definition of the fund. The finance director can explain it better than I, but it is an accounting construct. It is not a savings account. I did some research on this, and I came up with this uh, definition. The very term fund balance, however, is often misunderstood. Some misconceptions are that the fund is a savings account an amount of surplus cash, or in less count term, kind terms, a slush fund. In fact, fund balance is nothing more than an accounting construct. It is a difference between the government's funds, current assets, cash, short-term investments, inventories, receivables, and other restricted assets expected to be available to finance in the immediate future and its current liabilities. That's the definition of a fund. On one meeting, Mr. Jones said, that a fund, that, he need, that we weren't getting the balance of the fund, and that a fund is, by all terms, a surplus. Obviously, Mr. Jones does not know the definition of what a fund is. At that same meeting, Mr. Pierce said to Mr. Jones, it's a deliberative diversion, that the town manager and the finance director were making a deliberative diversion. Deliberate. Re deliberative. 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 Rather than giving the proper information. Uh, I would recommend that these members do research before making what one would consider both disrespectful remarks and remarks that information was, neither being, was either being withheld or full disclosure was not taking place. Mr. Pierce, according to his calculations, said that currently the undesignated fund is most likely zero. Tonight, I believe that we may be getting some information and we will find out whether Mr. Pierce is correct or the finance director is correct on what the fund is. Again, I suggest that if people are going to make comments directed at town employees that they know what they're talking about and they know what it means. At the uh, December 3rd meeting, again, the balance of the undesignated fund was brought up because they can't do the Warren articles until they know what's in the undesignated fund. And the question of why the audit is late was brought up. It has been explained why the audit is late. Up until last year when Mr. Selectman Bean, after reviewing the audit, said that Gatsby, G-A-S-B, 34, was not being adhered to and that we should do it, that the finance director in her first year on the job took on the task, went out, got the information, verified the information, compiled the information, entered the data. Not a simple task, a huge task, a huge undertaking. This should have been done by prior boards. Prior boards brought it up, Ten years but ago. they let it fall through. They didn't follow through. Last year it was followed through on. The finance director did it. That is one of the main reasons that the, that the uh, fund, that the audit is late. Not that anybody is causing any diversions that anybody is trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. At the end of the meeting on the 3rd, Mr. Pierce made a statement, I'm waiting until they are out of earshot. They, being the town manager, 
and the finance director. He was waiting until they had left the room before speaking. I was always told that if you get to something to say to somebody, you say it to their face. He then said that he is sick of the bullet BC, BS, I am paraphrasing exactly, that we're not being told everything, that it's not being transparent. I am making a motion that the Board of Selectmen take a vote of confidence in the town manager, the finance director, and the staff that they have, and I stress have, <coughs> and will continue to provide inf appropriate information under appropriate circumstances in a timely fashion, honest, and with full transparency. And I welcome a second. I'll second that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> is there any comment? I would just like to say that <clears throat> I hope that we're up, 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 approaching a time when uh, where people are going to be able to put their name up to be on the budget committee or any other elected board, the planning board, the um, ZBA, the board of selectmen. And part of the problem there is people get elected that no one else runs against them because not enough people have shown the interest. At least these people have shown the interest, but one didn't have anyone running against them, and the other one won because of a write-in. So <coughs> there needs to be more people that are willing to put their name up and do something as far as being a candidate and being a person that wants to devote the time to Hampton. Actually, I do have a quick comment. <coughs> I remember, uh, as I served on the Budget Committee 10 years ago, that we were reading the auditor's reports and begging to have GASB 34 implemented. And I talked to um, Mr. Egan at the uh, Plaza and Sanderson last week, and he said that it would have been much easier mm -hmm. if we had started that in 10 years ago. He said it really should have been done 10 years ago. And he said they had a, a, a real challenge um, getting the information together. And I said, is there something wrong with the computer? I didn't know if it was a computer. And he said, no, it was just ferreting out whatever the information was, and he complimented uh, Christy, saying she had done a, a wonderful job uh, working with uh, the audit staff to try to get it together. But I hope after this that when the auditors whom we are paying to do the work, they're pay we're paying them to produce this audit and this information for us, I hope we take their recommendations. I know people will say, oh, you don't need to do that or that's irrelevant or whatever. If I'm paying those auditors and they say to me, you need to implement general accounting standards such and such, we ought to do it instead of sitting here for 10 years, not us, but instead of sitting here for 10 years. And uh, I understand, I think uh, Scott told me GASB 78, the retirement uh, part is coming into play for 2015. And he said that'll be much easier to do. But... Uh, it is frustrating to see something have to go on for a whole year, but that really should have been done. I think when people do uh, take the time to run for public <clears throat> office, they shouldn't be uh, using it as a platform to uh, abuse the staff, and it, it just isn't right. Um, would you read your motion again, please? I make a motion that the Board of Selectmen give a vote of confidence to the town manager, the finance director, and their staff that they have, and I stress have again, and will continue to provide the appropriate information in a time, as timely fashion as possible, honest and with full transparency, and again, as they already have done. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Did nice you job, want Jim. to say something, Mr. Welch? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I... Uh, I have to bite my tongue all the way back to somewhere around my big toe, but um, I have to tell you that it's not, uh, it's not a pleasant thing to come to work each day and be told that you're a cheat and a liar, uh, and that's exactly what's been going on, and, and I have to tell you, I mean, Thursday night I mentioned that uh, on Tuesday we had sent out all the warrant articles on the Department of Public Works, which you had approved on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I do have a copy of the report here that went to the chairman of the budget committee. And it was 8.28, I believe, Monday morning, or 8.23 Monday morning, 
that I, yeah, 8.23 Monday morning, that I had in fact sent that report out to both her home address and her work address. And on Thursday night I was told it, it didn't, didn't have it. It's not there. It was not returned. If it was going to be returned, it would have been returned electronically as undeliverable. Let me just stop for a second. So you, you because I, I am the budget committee member, and thank you for your, your motion tonight. And, and I was there, and the chairman of the budget committee in Hampton said she, she did not have right. what you just said you sent. That's correct, and it was not returned. You sent it to both her personal email address and her work. That's correct. So there's an integrity issue somewhere. Well, this has been going on now for some weeks. Okay, because I, I do remember that. I don't say much at the budget committee. No, meetings. and I try not to say an awful lot at the budget committee, too, uh, simply because I don't want to start a controversy that doesn't need to be started. And they ask questions, we try to answer it. But I am, frankly, sick and tired of being called a liar and a cheat, and so are my, so are my staff and my people. Um, the department heads and so forth. Um, I stopped and witnessed a, uh, something that, well, if this had been a corporation and I had been the officer in charge, I would have fired everybody in the budget committee the night they went after the chairman of the, uh, the Conservation Commission in a manner that uh, smacked of uh, the Army McCarthy hearings. It was just untenable. It's unexcusable. Uh, and if it continues, I plan on taking some additional action with regards to it personally. So I thank the board for their support. I know that our people do. It's very difficult doing this work sometimes, and uh, being harassed on a regular basis is not fun. Thank you. May I ask Mr. Welch one quick question? Yeah, certainly. When I talked to Scott Egan last week, because it has been frustrating waiting for a 2014 audit, oh, yeah. the end of 2015. <clears throat> <clears throat> and he said he, the audit has cleared his desk. He's given it to the big guys, whoever the partners are. And he expected it to be released fairly soon. Did we, did we get anything today? I believe you're oh, going, she's to have, going to have goodness. some information from the finance <clears throat> oh, director okay. today. Because it just it, it seemed like a really long wait. But next year, the 2015 audit should be I fast. will say that we had to go back and... and uh, as you know, I've been collecting all the time. I've been here all the data on roads and, and public right. improvements and so forth. Yeah. We, we were all the way back to 1638 on roads and highways in order to make this thing completed. Yeah, he mentioned the road infrastructure. It was, yeah. it's, well, we've, we've looked up most of it. We have most of it available and handy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Chris, Christy was able to put all that together in their report for them. And that's how it got finished. It but was we just should never, dig. Never have to go through that again. If the we auditors won't. say do Gasby something or other, I don't care what it is. Do well, it. And, and make and, them and happy. De in defense of the administration, and I know I was here during this ten year period, not all of it. Um, on several occasions we put money in the budget which was turned down. Yeah. So uh, it was very expensive to do. We did this without spending a lot of money because we had devoted a tremendous amount of staff time, time. to it. And Christy devoted a tremendous amount of time in her office to getting this done. Mm -hmm. Without her able assistance, and she worked night and day on it, um, it never would have been finished. Now Scott specifically mentioned the cooperation <coughs> they had from Christy. Yes. Which is good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to announcements and community calendar. Mr. Waddell. Yes, I would like to. John Nyan, the uh, chairman of the Experience Hampton, gave me a call. <coughs> And he wanted me to thank all of the town uh, elected officials, the boards, the employees, and everybody who helped make the Christmas parade uh, last Saturday an extremely successful event. He was, he was very happy with the cooperation <coughs> he had from the town and all of his employees and departments. Good. Mr. Bridal. Uh, just on that same note, the tree lighting the night before on, on the uh, 4th. Uh, I have never seen so many people in our downtown square at one time. Uh, there had to have been four or five, six hundred people down there enjoying the music, enjoying the, uh, the food and stuff that was put out there by the various restaurants. Even Jim and I ended up popping popcorn to give everybody. So it was, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. There was a lot of people there. We were very fortunate to have some nice weather. Oh, yeah. But I'd, I'd personally like to thank the rec department for all they did for putting that on, and to the local merchants that really yeah. stepped up and, and made that a warm and inviting place for the townspeople on, uh, on Friday night. So, thank you. I would just like to, um, <clears throat> to, you know, I'd like to 
uh, say something in regards to that this is the anniversary of Pearl Harbor and yeah. it was brought out tonight that it hasn't been mentioned a lot but I think it's something that's very important and something we don't want to forget. Mrs. Wolseley. Yes, um, to be picky, please refrain from putting furniture and large objects on the side of the road oh, yeah. at this time of year. Uh, such objects should not be put in the public way in any event because they're not going to be picked up. They have, you have to arrange if you have a sofa or some other big piece of, of equipment. But now getting into, we hope not very soon, plowing season, we cannot have these large objects. I, yeah. I mentioned to the manager a couple of weeks ago, <coughs> one on my particular street, we can't have large objects clogging the road and have them in the way of the plows. And also try to be careful of your carts, too, that they're not swinging around in the middle of the street. Without the mechanical packer going through, there tend to be more of the carts flapping around out there. So uh, just try to be cautious, try to get those carts in, and please don't put big objects on town property on the side of the road. Mr. Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mm -hmm. The religious holiday season is upon us. To those uh, of that wonderful faith, happy Hanukkah. Uh, there were some great events this, uh, this weekend. Uh, the two senators were on board, uh, our, our beloved state senator, Senator Stiles, and um, the, uh, the new senator uh, came down from Washington and uh, took time to uh, uh, visit with the people of Hampton, and I thought that was remarkable given everything that's going on in this world and responsibilities down in Washington, D.C., and how that woman, uh, the U.S. senator, lives up to uh, our high expectations of representation to take the, come down, take the time to come down on a weekend um, away from not only her family but away from her responsibilities and share that in Hampton I thought was magnificent. Uh, the two reps, uh, Cushing, Rice, great jobs. Rainey was just recognized, I read in the paper, <laughs> yeah. for um, some outstanding leadership that he provides. So yeah. it was fun. In the business community, uh, those that produced the uh, event, John and I, and uh, John and uh, Fred were yelling at me the whole time to get back in line. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. Did a lot day. of good, didn't yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, not all of us get to ride with Mike, Mary Louise. Fred, um, Fred was advertising, I mean, uh, Phil was advertising cigars, too. Yes, yes it, was a, it, was, it was a very nice cigar. But uh, um, in terms of core competencies, in terms of uh, uh, character, in terms of integrity, in terms of uh, such a, um, a wonderful place to live throughout the world, many people do not have what we have in this town. Many people in this state don't have what we have in this town. And with the senator from Washington, our senator coming down here, recognizes the strength and the high caliber of the citizens in the businesses and those that work for the town of Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to the consent agenda. <clears throat> Number one is request for no objection of service of alcohol. Also move. Second. And that's the new restaurant for the galley hatch. All those in favor? Unanimous. Moving on to appointments, we have Jane Cipher, the town clerk, here for budget revision request. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I come before you this evening because I received notification on Friday that uh, one of our state reps is resigning or has resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, he no longer lives in Hampton, so um, that's one of the one of the reasons um, for his resignation. Um, with that, we'll bring a special election. With that, brings more funding. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I worked up the numbers today, and it's around seventy-four hundred dollars more uh, than we had anticipated. With what could possibly be two more elections in an already four election year, um, if we have to have a special election, obviously it's you know that would be because we have more than one person running um, f per party. So we hopefully won't have to have a special election, but we obviously have to plan for it. Um, so having two separate elections um, increases the uh, ballot clerk wages by a little over three thousand dollars each for each election, and then the food <coughs> service would would increase um, by two food services, which is uh, $1,200. And then um, I 
increase the supplies by $100, figuring with two more elections we, you know, just had to do that. It does not affect the coding for the, um, the memory cards for the AccuVote machines because special elections are hand count. So we will not be getting the AccuVote cards. We'll have to hand count those elections. The good news with that is it shouldn't take us very long because it's our last special election in 2008 when Jane Kelly resigned. Um, we had 1,400 voters show up at the polls that day, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, of a, it'll be a long day, but um, as far as the counting goes, it shouldn't take up too much time in the evening. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. Um, I have spoken with the um, chairman of the budget committee, and um, she advised that I didn't need to come before them again, so I, she just asked me to put something in writing to her, giving her those figures, which I did today. So, And I also cc the uh, vice chair just in case there was any question as to whether or not I actually sent the information to her because I have been in the same situation that Fred and Christy have been in with her. So, so what happens if only one person puts their name up? We, oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> if there's only, I mean, I, I can only assume we would have one from each party, at least one from each party. Yeah. I would suspect that both, both party um, come up parties would come up with someone. Yeah. Um, that's something I would have to ask the Secretary of State's office, but I suspect. So that would unless be an issue. there's more than one for each one, there would at least be one election, probably. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Questions for Jane? How soon does that have to take place? Is there a. Um, that's all up to uh, the Executive Council. Um, my understanding from reading the RSA is it needs to go, it needs to be held between, I think it was 80, 80 and 180 days. It was 80, 80 days or 160 days, Fred. Do you remember what that was? I thought it was 80. It was between 80 and 160. And 160. Right. From when he resigned. From when he resigned, right. which was right. Friday, the 4th of December. So <clears throat> um, it's my intention when I have the opportunity to speak with the Secretary of State's office that we try to hold it at the same time as another election if that's is if that that's allow if it's allowable i'm not sure whether it is at this mm -hmm. point um i've been at the win i have staff out so i've been at the window for the last week and will be through probably the first week of january so um my desk has kind of been put on hold to, to be able to serve the customers how so. about the window for uh putting your papers in to be on the on the ballot for the primary, for the, I mean, for the special election, yeah. that all depends on the, when, when the election is held. Okay. Yep. So, Mr. Bridal? No, all set. Thank you for Mrs. coming. Mrs. Wilson. Wilson. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the information, Jane. There's nothing we can do about Mr. the money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, I mean it's one yeah. of those things we kind of <laughs> we don't really have much of a choice. Thank you very much for all the hard work that you do. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate it. Next, we have Peter Chappelle, <laughs> Health uh -huh. Trust. How are you this evening? I'm good, thank you. That's good. Please join us. At Thanks the for inviting me. <clears throat> the first thing I'll do is hand out some packets. No. Ah. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. There may be an extra there. So, as some of you know, I, um, I have and will continue to be your benefits advisor on our benefits team, and I've worked with the town for many years. Um, and in more recent times, I, I know I've met with. Jim and Phil um, on some cost and utilization and stewardship reporting. But I understand that you wanted me to come and go over the January renewal, the 2016 mm -hmm. renewal yeah. um, with you. And I think you probably all have the basic information that was communicated to the town. Um, in this packet on the right hand side, <coughs> I have included just in case you haven't seen it, the renewal letter that was sent to Fred and Christy. Um, and then behind that is what our underwriters put together. Uh, it's basically called a rating summary. And that kind of gives you the the step-by-step -step process of how we arrived at the 26 renewal rates. And yes, compared to 2015, um, it's gone up considerably. As you might remember, in 2015, the overall, um, well, there was an overall decrease of negative 10. Right. This time, 
for 2016, there is an overall increase of 17.3. That's a that's a quite a big swing. And as we go through this, and I don't know how deeply you want me to go through this, but uh, it really comes down to claim experience, claim utilization. It real it spiked up quite considerably uh, in the last year. Um, so in the letter, it explains um, the overall January pool, uh, the overall average for all the groups in the pool, and the pool is made up of individually rated groups, which are basically groups over 51 lives and on up to um, many hundreds. Then there is a small groups pool in the January uh, cycle. But the overall average of all the groups was 8.15. So there was an increase overall in the January pool as a, as a basis point. Um, then that adjustment can change depending on the size of the group and the group's experience. Uh, and we'll touch on that when I get into the rating summary. The trend factor that the actuaries came up with and was approved by our board uh, was around 6%, which it's been single digit for a while now. Um, so that's the cost of claim utilization going out. They trend it going out and, and then also based on past ex claims experience. And then there's also a point in here that approximately, this is overall now, approximately 92% of any premium that we you know, ask for, from groups based on their experience is around about 92% of that is all claims related. So we can, do, we can do some things to try to drill down and find out where these claims come from. I don't know. This information is not telling you the individuals. We, you know, Anthem has that information. We don't. Um, but obviously there was some spikes and there were some large claims as well. And um, so if, we, if you want to go through this summary, which I think Christy gave you these summaries or at least a summary of this year's and the previous year. Um, it's a three-page document. It's the next one. Yeah. So I thought I'd start with that. Now this would be a summary that we, we would give to any group. And it's also the summary that's used on the, on the pool-wide basis, all right? So when we go to public hearing, our actuaries and board members um, are there to go through a similar rating process for the, the entire January pool. And this is specifically geared towards Hampton's uh, claims. So quickly, you can see that the, re that the period that's being looked at here is July of 14 through June of 15, and then paid through July 31st of 15, all right? So we're looking for, through a period, each rating cycle, um, that we use, and basically this, this activity is done in the late summer and into the fall. And then we go through our public hearings, and then the board approved approves the rate adjustments. So the reported medical claims for the period was uh, 2,882,146, and then you have the, re the reported prescription claims, uh, um, and then C is the total. So that total was 3.3 million six three eight eight forty. Then what happens is we we kind of take claims, individual claims, in excess of one hundred and fifty thousand out of the experience. Okay. Um, that amounted to 17712 So that's subtracted from the total reported claims. Um, then you have net reported claims. And then you have something called um, IBNR reserves. That's incurred but not reported. So we know what was paid. We know what was incurred. But there are also some claims that were reported and haven't been paid yet. So there's an actuarial assumption used as to how much uh, has not been reported yet to be paid. That, that amounted to 45192 So you have a total rating claims of 3,666,320. Then it follows through on page two. Um, the actuaries have to trend it going forward, the, the claim utilization. And you can see that amounted to 328751 Then there's a pool claims fee which all groups in the pool contribute towards. 
And this was for the pulling claims in excess of 150,000. So on, you mentioned on, or I mentioned on page one, that amount was 17,712. So any, any group that has claims in excess, there's a pooling fee, it, it's spread across the pool and other groups contribute towards that. Then you can see, and there's formula here and, and per the percentage is used, but you, you can see J through, let's say L. Uh, the health trust risk fee is essentially how we set reserves. We have to have reserves for um, if we're not on target um, actuarially. Then Anthem has an administration fee of, and that amounts to 3.44%. And you can see how that figures in to the actual amounts on the right-hand side. Health trust administration fee, that's for everything we do, including all our wellness activities and so on. Uh, that amounted to uh, 111429 Then there's also um, some state assessment fees, Affordable Care Act fees. They don't amount to too much, but each group has to, has to pay them as required by um, state fees and laws. So then there's a projected uh, member contribution of 4551605 And then we compare that to what, we're, what we've asked for for 2015. If it's over, um, then obviously we need more. It, on page three, if you look at item P, group experience, that 23.3% would essentially be what the town of Hampton's experience should be, okay, based on claim activity. Um, but we also use what's called a credibility factor. And essentially what that is, is depending on the size of the group. So for instance, if we have a group with a thousand lives in it, that's deemed as fully credible or fully believable that your experience is going to be believed from one year to the next. Hamptons is around 50%, 49.9. Um, then we have, we, we base it against the health trust pool, January pools, overall rate change was at 8.15. We factor that in with the, with the credibility and there's formula there and we come up with 15.8. And then we reconcile it based on all the other adjustments in the pool, and we came up with 17.3. Obviously, that's ob it, it's a big number, and we had a range from in our small group pool we had a range of about three percent up to I know one group got I think 23 or 25 percent rate increase. But again, <coughs> ma it's mainly based on claims. What can we do about claims? Some of some, in some cases, we can't do anything about it because they just happen, both medical and prescription. Other ways we can combat claims or at least look at them is to drill down. We have something called a cost and utilization report, which I, I think Phil and Jim have seen before. Um, that shows on an aggregate basis for a time period of two years um, what factors may be may be lending themselves towards these claim increases. Uh, you know, like disease factors, it could be cardio, it could be, you know, back problems, it could be any number of things. It could be cancers, it can be one-off claims that perhaps the, the person passes away and that, that claim goes away, or it could be a trend. So I'm gonna order those that, that kind of a report for you again and see what, where we can help you with either wellness uh, programs or uh, workshops. Um, further education is probably necessary, but we haven't we haven't drilled down into that yet, so I don't know th those particular factors. But I wanted you to at least see what factors we use to arrive at your increase. Are there any questions on that portion? Questions. I'm going to defer to Mr. Uh, Bean yeah. since he's the insurance guy. Mr. Bean, you want to start this? And uh, for the record, we don't do health insurance. Uh, at least I don't <laughs> know we bid on the uh, um, account uh, or will we ever be interested in it. Uh, thanks. Um, you, you touched on uh, the benefits that you provide in terms of wellness, in terms of uh, some of those ancillary programs that are outside of the purview of straight premium in pain medical right. care. H how well does Hampton 
exploit what you have to offer to reduce premium increases in usage? Well, I wish Bill Byron was here because he's a <coughs> wellness advisor, but I know in even in the past, um, I know it hasn't been, I would say, utilized as much as it could be. Please tell us a success story for a municipality that vigorously drills down and exploits wellness opportunities to mitigate premium increase. I can't give you off the top of my head a municipality, but I can give you some, because we also have school districts. Mm -hmm. um, I know um, the Merrimack School District has done quite well. And where, what we find is if a municipality or any of our groups, particularly larger groups, can form some form of a health committee or a wellness committee mm -hmm. where we can come in and really engage them into wellness practices, uh, biometric screenings, maybe holding a biometric screening here in Hampton. SAU 90 has one at the academy. I know um, that we hold about 46 of these biometric screenings all over the state. Um, we need to get in and educate your folks and Bill, Bill and I can work on that. But um, I, I know there's there's several school districts, and I know there are some towns that engage in this quite a lot. Others don't. Um, they say they might, but it never really happens. So I think it's important to, from the town perspective, maybe get a committee together of people that can sort of harness this energy and then bring us in and we can help, you know, provide workshops or ideas as to how you can more engage yourself in wellness activities because wellness activities we're finding and in the biometric screenings and all in the slice of life programs we're finding do really make a difference um, though the groups that do engage in this more we see their claims being mitigated again you can't help the one-offs but on a ongoing basis and you get people really, really motivated and using the Smart Shopper program and the Wellness and the Slice of Life program more, we find that those claims get mitigated more than ones that don't. Thank you. Can you integrate uh, a school uh, entity with uh, the municipal government side in terms of those committees? Um, usually we do it, you know, at each group level. Are you talking about a combination of entities for well, rating purposes? Let's say U90 is a customer. Yeah. You just said Town of Hampton's a customer. Yeah. Plans are plans are plan. Health insurance is yeah. health insurance. Wellness is wellness is wellness. Yeah. You're in the hood. Um, it's the same people. It may be spouses that work for the town and for the and for the school. Mm. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make much sense to um, put up firewalls. And I know from the biometric screening angle, whatever we do in Hampton, uh, anybody from the town can come to. So that is, that is an open access to wellness activities. Hmm. And uh, does that become more important as we address uh, that nebulous, nefarious thing called Washington and the Cadillac tax, if we can mitigate uh, so the increase? The, one of the things that the Health Trust Board, and you probably saw this information, and if you see this green sheet, you may have seen this. One of the reasons why Health Trust <coughs> has come up with these plan enhancements and plan changes over the next couple of years is just that, to help, to, to help, you know, get a mindset on mo maybe moving to less costly plan types. One of the things we decided to do was eliminate the indemnity plans. The indemnity plans, like the J plans and the comp plans, those are, those are being done away with. Um, those plans have continually cost more. They're, they're rich plans, um, and they do trigger the Cadillac tax, which is coming in 2018, and everybody's concerned about that. We also, as far as consolidating plan types, we're, we're sort of getting into a preferred bundle of plans. Um, some of them have higher co-pays. Uh, some of them have alternative prescriptions to get away from the $1 mail, which is also going away in 2018. Um, so we're doing everything we can. That's not the sole reason why we're doing all this, but it's one of the, one of the reasons is to get people thinking about the Cadillac tax because 
as far as we know, it's not going away. Um, who knows? The 40 percent excise factor might might change. The thresholds might change. But as it stands now, and they've tried to repeal it a number of times, as it stands now, it's legislated and it, it's due to come along. So another thing we can help you with is take a look at your current plans and even alternative plan types that will bring the cost down from a premium standpoint. It may increase the co-pays. It may introduce deductibles. But we have a calculator, and you probably have seen it. Uh, some of you may have seen it. We have a, a Cadillac tax calculator that basically you can plug in, plug in your current premium of your current plans and then any alternative plans and see across till 2018 whether it turns red. And if it turns red, it's triggering the tax. If it doesn't, it won't. We use um, a 6.5% trend factor or adjustment factor if you want, but you can play around with that. So that's been quite popular as people plan, as, as groups plan towards avoiding the Cadillac tax and kind of moving from the rich plans towards more affordable plans. Yeah. And in terms of employing that, uh, that tool, uh, is that being used by the town of Hampton now? I know the town of Hampton has it. I don't Finance know. Finance is nodding ahead. Finance. HR has it also. Christy, Christy has it. I know I sent it to her. Okay, I'm sure the uh, selectman would like a, a, a brief on that from finance and HR. So Excellent. That's great. Excellent. Uh, I see in uh, in your your uh, great work here, David Friedman has uh, sent this uh, this letter dated October 21st to Frank Swift, Matt Newton, Joe Jones, and Alan Jones. Those are the presidents of the locals here in town. Do you work with municipalities in negotiations and uh, have a joint uh, effort with? each individual uh, with, with the union heads, it's addressed to our four unions right here. Absolutely. You do, okay, and I don't, I don't know if we're doing that that strongly in this town, mm -hmm. and uh, parts is parts is parts, and health insurance is health insurance. Yeah. I would say over the past few years, we've worked um, quite closely, depending on what was being negotiated, with public works, with fire. I mean, Bill and I have been to fire several times. Mm -hmm. um, and sitting down with them as a group and going through all of what we just talked about and showing them where the rates are coming from, what the plans look like, and also I think it's important <coughs> to talk about the Cadillac tax and talk about the ACA to both union and management. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And if I could just go on for one more moment. Uh, there was a... Uh, Case with uh, local government center, and this isn't to put you on the hot seat. And maybe you thought some of these questions were going to come tonight, but it was from uh, Don Mitchell. Yeah. And uh, this hit the street, and we all got a copy of this. Um, well, it came out in October, so um, we reviewed it. Uh, and I don't need individual responses. We'll, we'll send these up to you. Perhaps Mark can, perhaps Human Resources can. But on page five, it says there's insufficient evidence credible that's been presented that uh, the participation in the PLT lease and its service agreement does not constitute subsidization by health and health health incorporated trust. Is that you? Health, health and trust. trust. Okay, yeah. so here we have these these rate increases, these incredible challenge. And again, I just I want to get this on the record and I would like and I know the board would like our townspeople, the actual ratepayers and the employees, the ratepayers. It it appears from that sentence on page five that their health insurance premium dollars are subsidizing a failed property casualty provider to the mm -hmm. state that's been shut down by the state. And, and that for people uh, and taxpayers and, and uh, employees that are paying these astronomical premiums uh, is problematic and we'll want, we'll want to know a dollar figure on that because the position's uh, been raised and uh, it's never been answered. So it would appear that at least some of our rate on that one specific area is subsidizing. And that was the whole reason of the PLT yeah. with this problem in the first place, yeah. with Dave Lang bringing this up. And now, and we know things around the flagpole sometimes get confusing. Um, and this isn't to put you on the spot, Pete. I no, know, I know and of course, Health thing. Trust and PLT <clears throat> have been totally separated. And then it, it says that at the time the documents were prepared, it said um, there, were, uh, there was um, an executive director and chief financial officer of the PLT were also employed by a sister enterprise, Health Trust, Inc., each shared their time between the two organizations. 
They were responsible for generating financial data that was incorporated into statements of the PLT's financial position and constituted the basis for financial data. PLT's financial and actuarially consulted Towers Watson, who has prepared PLT's critical financial documents for over 20 years, produced the reports. It's noteworthy not only because of the length of the institutional relationship, but because the senior consultant had worked on PLT's account for over 20 years, nearly 12 of which included the combined effort of the PLT's executive director, Parker. So we've got people wearing two hats, mm -hmm. getting two incomes, we're experiencing huge rates, and we would like a drill down on exactly what the firewall is on that and what the costs are, because certainly the ratepayers are paying that. And again, this is out of um, Mr. Steele's, uh, um, Mr. Mitchell's Mr. Mr. Mitchell, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah. And let me just let me just go on here and, and pause for a second as I read some of the um, um, notes. Again, we've we've seen this problem where where um, the PLT and again it, it doesn't appear there's fire firewalls. Um, PLT has backed into um, uh, rates, um, and these 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 premium increases were were backed into and. These people at the PLT are backing into rates for the PLT, and they're also working for your company. So when they're working for the PLT, do they do things like backing into rates? And then when they work for the health trust, they don't do that. To me, that doesn't sound like that probably is really happening. And they were taking rates from workers' comp, and they were charging to subsidize other levels in the property liability rate. So we've got people working for both companies doing one thing that Mr. Mitchell finds unacceptable, and he shuts down an organization, and they've got those same people working for your company, and it's costing us money. So I think that's, uh, that's a problem. Going on with his uh, report, uh, there were uh, rate increases that were not determined through actuarial analysis. Do you have the same actuary as the PLT did? I don't know that for a okay. fact. I think um, probably to get a better feel for a response to that, you might you, know, you probably should touch base with David okay. Friedman. In this report, in, in, in terms of, of what it brings out uh, to people that are, are your customers, um, it's, it's problematic. Uh, there's a rental agreement and on page 24, without sufficient evidence explaining the substantial reduction in, in its rental cost, subsidization by its landlord is a reasonable conclusion. Who owns that building that you, uh, you were in up there, do you know? I don't know off the, the top trust. of my head. Yeah, so if it, the Health Trust owns it, mm -hmm. they're, they're giving a break to PLT that's been put out of business, and they're giving a, a rent break that's mm -hmm. below market value and we're paying more in premium. To me, that doesn't sound logical. Um, another portion of the PLT's operation relates to uh, an agreement the PLT has with co-tenant in the Triangle Park property, Health Trust Inc. That's your company, right? Okay. It says in relations to PLT's operation of departments, Health Trust acts as its finance department. This is for a company that was put out of business, your company, that's giving us a 17% rate increase, uh, acted as PLT's finance department, provides its information technology, provides its human resource services, um, provides its marketing, its communication services, provides its risk control services, provides PLT's member relations services. There's been little accounting by P PLT for how any of these personnel issues in involved with these were tracked. And I, I bet your company doesn't track them, and I bet they're prodigious amounts. I bet they're, they're, they're tens and tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and we're getting rate increases. And, they, and I'm not putting you on the spot, Pete, but I, I, this is important. We've got the Cadillac tax. Uh, we've got 17% rate increases, and this is something that we're going to fully explore with your company. Um, the combined services, and this is Mr. Mitchell's words, are substantial and critical to PLT's operation, but beyond the line item indicating that the service agreement budget allocation was just over $500,000 for the past two fiscal years. No evidence was put forward by the PLT, PLT to show that this agreement did not constitute, which is the point I'm trying to make, 
of a subsidization by a third party, which would be your company. So uh, moving away from that, we're going to look forward to uh, our wellness. We're looking at uh, a, a, a link up with the entire municipal platform here. Uh, better conversation with all of our negotiation. And then um, perhaps uh, human resources uh, can evaluate this um, Mitchell document uh, in the matter of the local government center and now Health Trust Inc. as it relates to us because we think there's substantial uh, revenue that we're contributing from Hampton that's gone to the PLT and we don't want to pay that and we would like to negotiate. And I, I don't want to speak for the board. But whether it's ten thousand dollars or eight thousand or twenty-seven thousand, whatever it is, money's money. It's our money, and yeah. we should not be through health insurance subsidizing the PLT, which is the reason Dave Lang went uh, to the great efforts he did to uh, unlink that problem. So I, I, I thank you for your time, and again, I don't expect your answers, but I wanted to raise that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions, Mr. Waddell, Mr. Bridal. All set. Mrs. No, Volsley, and we're moving to yeah. the. Could I uh, ask you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chapel? Yes, uh, of course the uh, insurance, health insurance that's provided by Health Trust. Health Trust is the provider, but Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield is the actual administrator. <laughs> that is correct. And so, Health Trust itself is nonprofit. That's right. Anthem, of course, is profit. Right. Anthem uh, goes out and. What Health Trust does is you count on Anthem for administering claims and also for <coughs> negotiating the rates that are paid by Health Trust. We, we take advantage of whatever discounts they negotiate with various providers. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's right. We set our own rates, but they negotiate with the providers. That's correct. Right. So the problems that Anthem has experienced with hospitals like Exeter Hospital, where for a time it looks like no one's going to be able to use Anthem for mm -hmm. Exeter Hospital. The source is not Health Trust, it's Anthem, isn't that right? Yeah. Anthem has to work out their contra contractual issues with each provider, yes. I did want to ask you, has an evaluation been done by Health Trust as to whether or not you might ought to move to a different um, administrator than Anthem and get, a, get perhaps better rates? Hmm. I know... Um, I know all our providers have contracts with us, and um, I don't know sp specifically how many times we might have looked at other providers as far as the health insurance goes. I know we go out periodically with our for our RX benefits, um, but I don't know, you know, exactly on the Anthem side. Right. We do negotiate um, administrative fees with them, and actually what they do for us and what we'll do for them. As far as a partnership goes, we d we do we do uh, negotiate that. So last year we we enjoyed an, a, a decrease in rates of ten percent. This year your projecting rate is a seventeen percent plus increase. Overall, depending on what you know, it can differ per plan type, but yes. And what I wanted to ask you is some of that attributable to Anthem as opposed to our own individual pool experience with mm. claims. That would be your own. That would be your own claim experience. Yep. The factors that are used as far as the administration fees and the trend and so on are set for all groups. But then what <coughs> those factors are then um, basically related to your own claim experience to come up with the actual dollar amounts. And, and just one follow-up, you've, you've got your administrative charges and you've got um, Anthem's administrative charges. It would seem to me that you would have a, a sole provider for that. In K, it's 137000 in L. And that, is that just for Hampton? Uh, where are we now? We're on page K. two of three of your, your uh, yes, presentation. Yes, that's a Hampton number. So those Hampton numbers, we're paying for, we're paying about 5% for administration, which to me, uh, for a captive group, for uh, people that are pretty much here all the time. There may be uh, a spouse, there may be uh, a divorce, mm -hmm. unfortunately, there may be a new baby, but um, the premium of 3.44 and 2.79, six points just to push paper in this, uh, in this era of technology, to me, uh, to Mark's point, um, I think there, there's fat in that. And I think if you're doing two points on two million um, is a reduction, and we'd be interested in those. And, 
HR can, can get this point. Um, again, that's, that's money. That's, uh, in terms of labor negotiations, that's a half point for a bargaining unit. And I think that your, your administrative fees of 3.44 and 2 point, you're, you're over six points. And I, I think that's too high. I really do. And I think it ought to be uh, more like four. Mm -hmm. So again, we'll, we'll, include, we'll include that. And um, we'll be cooking with gas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Any other comments? No. Yeah. Would you like I to do. join us? <laughs> Did you have some material? No. No. In connection with this? Yep. No. Okay. Good. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> she has lots to contribute besides. That's right. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. in this Thank evening. You. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was a little scary with two of you drilling down. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> uh. Moving on to, we're going to have something special. Did you want to open Where are we? for this? I got a council open. Um, the board at its meeting on November 9 uh, engaged in <coughs> some uh, question of the trustees of the trust funds in relation to the SEC's order of September 3, 2015, which found that there had been fraudulent conduct on the part of Mackinson and Company in connection with their marketing of services uh, to uh, municipalities uh, for their trust funds. And uh, the questions to the trustees of the trust funds focused on uh, what they knew, when they knew it, and what they had done about it. And the answers indicated that uh, once the trustees of the trust funds knew about it, there was very little discussion uh, by them, very little investigation by them, uh, before they took a vote on October 19, 2015, at a meeting where there were very few people in attendance, in which they reaffirmed their relationship with Mackinson and Company. Uh, there was uh, indication on the part of one or two trustees that had they, if they knew that there was a continuing relationship with Warren Mackinson himself, with Mackinson and Company, if he continued to derive income from Mackinson and Company, if he had some managerial relationship with Mackinson and Company, then they might feel differently about the subject. But nevertheless, they indicated they had not made that kind of inquiry. We passed that information along to the Attorney General's office, who have been investigating this not only with regard to Hampton, but with 28 other municipalities uh, who are similarly invested uh, with the investment advisor with Mackinson and Company. And uh, the uh, Charitable Trust Division uh, called Mr. Mays <coughs> up to uh, Concord, uh, had questions of him, and answered certainly open questions that we still had after November 9th. And those answers indicated, uh, as they indicate in a letter dated November 20th to all trustees, that Mr. Mackinson uh, has a right to remain on the Mackin and Mackinson and Company Board of Directors until he is completely bought out by Mr. Mays, and the business name cannot be changed during that time frame. Yeah. Yeah. And the Attorney General's Office in that November 20 letter uh, indicates that um, individual boards of trustees uh, should separately seek assurances on behalf of their own municipalities about the practices of Mackinson and Company and whether they want to continue to do business with Mackinson and Company. Okay. Now, in order, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I think we should read this letter. I'll be glad to read it. This is from um, Thomas J. Donovan, Director of Charitable Trust, and it's regarding Mackinson and, Mackinson and Company SEC sanctions order. Dear Trustees, you are no doubt aware that the United States Securities and Exchange Commission issued an administrative order dated September 3, 2015 against Mackinson and Company, Inc. and Warren J. Mackinson. This letter is written because we understand that you are trustees of a municipal fund for which Mackinson and Company, Inc. serves as the investment advisor. 
neither, neither the charitable trust unit nor any of the municipalities was aware of this proceeding. Even though the SEC investigation commenced in 2012, when we found out about it, we made a referral to the New Hampshire Bureau of Securities Regulation. We also met with David Mays, the president and current owner of Mackinson and Company, together with his lawyer. With respect to municipal trustees, our primary concern at the CTU is that the trustees follow their fiduciary duties and obey relevant New Hampshire statute, statutes. To that end, we offer seminars and written materials. If we believe that trustees are not complying with the statutory requirements or fiduciary duties that with respect to investments, we will counsel and, if necessary, take action against those trustees. That said, we do not have the jurisdiction to pursue investment managers or investment companies <coughs> that work with municipalities or with any other charitable trust. In light of the sanctions, trustees do have a fiduciary responsibility to review their investment relationship with Mackinson and Company. They should look at their returns and perhaps seek a meeting with Mr. Mays. They may also wish to consult with counsel concerning their options, which could include continuing their relationship with Mackinson and Company, changing investment advisors, and or bringing legal action against the business. We have been concerned with the solvency and continued suitability of the investments that Mackinson and Company uses with municipalities. We asked those questions of Mr. Mays and his lawyer, and we were assured that the investments are placed in large mutual fund type products, not proprietary to Mackinson and Company. We were told that the funds are all solvent and could easily withstand withdrawals by any or all of the municipalities that have funds invested there. You should all, you should separate, separately seek those assurances on behalf of your own municipality should you decide to continue to do business with Mackinson and Company. We have also been concerned with the nature of the violations outlined in the order, i.e. that Mackinson and Company and Mr. Mackinson misled municipalities in promotional material as to the past performance of Mackinson and Company portfolio. That is fraudulent conduct. Municipalities have relied upon those misrepresentations to engage Mackinson and Company. How have the municipalities been harmed by this fraud? It all comes down to money. There are statutory remedies and they focus on losses, including whether a municipality missed out on a higher rate of return with another investment advisor by switching to or staying with Mackinson and Company. That is a fact intensive inquiry and will vary among municipalities. We cannot perform that review. You will need to consult town council on that point and on whether other opportunities for relief may exist. You might also consult the Bureau of Securities Regulation. Finally, we learned something of the continuing relationship between Mr. Mackinson and Mackinson and Company. Mr. Mays bought the business in 2012, shortly before the SEC investigation began. He is paying Mr. Mackinson over time Mr. Mackinson has a right to remain on the Mackinson and Company Board of Directors until he is paid off, and the business name cannot be changed during that time frame. Mr. Mackinson no longer serves in any capacity with the business. As you can imagine, the SEC order must be a source of ongoing discussion between Mr. Mays and Mr. Mackinson. All of this may affect how Mr. Mays decides to continue his business. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Very truly yours, Thomas J. Donovan, Director of Charitable Trust. And uh, as it says, we cannot perform the review. You will need to consult town council on that point on whether other opportunities for relief may exist. 
and this is our town council. Thanks. Do you want to continue? Yeah, thank you, Rick. Um, it, just the one point, I know you read this, it's a long letter. Mr. Max no longer serves in any other capacity with the business. He is a director, uh, continues to be a director of the business. So the board had charged uh, my office with looking into the facts of the matter, what the trustees knew, when did they know it, what did they do to, to follow up on it. Uh, we've heard from them. We've now heard from the Attorney General's office. Uh, this board has overall <coughs> responsibilities for town financial affairs, uh, including uh, evaluating the, uh, the trustees of the trust fund's performance. Uh, the trustees, by the way, uh, are not apparently going to meet on this subject again until their, their regular quarterly meeting, January 19th, 2016. Uh, their agenda is on the town's uh, website under trustees of the trust funds, although uh, Mr. Silberdick mentioned that they would at that time evaluate whether to continue um, in aff affiliation with Maxson and Company as investment advisor. I do not see that particular item on their agenda. So uh, I leave that. I was asked to report to the board, and that's my report to the board for your comment and direction. Comments? for a town council. Mr. Bridal. Where do we move from here? I think this board has the ability to uh, uh, at least voice its concerns to the trustees of the trust funds to urge them if you wish to act more quickly on this subject and in a, in a uh, rather than waiting until the January meeting to, uh, to, it, to at least look into it uh, to be uh, this, this letter uh, that was addressed to them did not come to us. This letter, which was issued November 20, went to the trustees, but is not on their website and has not been uh, provided to us by the trustees. So they continue not to be forthcoming to this board about what they're doing. And you could uh, certainly voice your feelings about that if you, f if you wished. M Mrs. Walsley. This may be a really stupid question, but it references in the letter that Rick read about a an individual uh, such as Mr. Mackinson profiting from still being party to the business in whatever capacity at, as a director. Um, if he is being paid out in segments for his interest in the business, would that constitute being paid a profit? Well, there's a couple of aspects to that. Uh, at one time, Mr. Mackinson owned a percentage share in National Advisors Trust, which are, is the location in which all the money, all Kansas $20 million, dollars, yeah. is invested of, of the trustees of the, that the trustees have. Okay. That's one aspect to look at. Uh, they did not, in fact, the AG's office did not address whether Mr. Maxson actually is getting some remuneration. financial remuneration for being a director. Oh. That's another question to ask. Because that's different from being paid whatever lump sum to sell the business. Correct. Would have been. Yeah. Correct. And, and I would think that the trustees of the trust funds, in due diligence, would want to ask those questions okay. and meet with Mr. Mays. Okay. And, uh, in, and respond to this letter in a proactive way. Okay. Mr. Bean. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, page two of the document um, from Thomas J. Donovan, Director of Charitable Trusts, uh, quote, unquote, that is fraudulent conduct. That's Mr. Mackinson and we don't need to uh, belabor it, former elected official in this town, bookkeeper for the Board of Trustees, uh, sought this business. Uh, the Security and Exchange Commission has equally said that it's fraudulent conduct. It's fined his firm $100,000. Uh, Mr. Mackinson is profiting as a former elected official in this town for someone that put that business and steered that business while he was a member of that board. He is profiting from fraud as defined by the Director of Charitable Trust in New Hampshire and by the United States Government Security and Exchange Commission. 
these is a three-year-old problem. It's a five-year-old problem when you go back to um, Mr. Mackinson's tenure as an elected official. The Board of Trustees under Mr. Silberdick uh, really has to uh, start meeting in public. They need their meetings televised. Uh, if somebody can write this down, I'll be prepared to make those motions. They have wide and broad uh, um, uh, authority to do what they want. This is tens of millions of dollars. There's fraud involved, and we are not kept informed. We have never been kept informed. Uh, I doubt we will be kept informed. Uh, I doubt how much the Board of Trustees uh, for the trust funds is informed about what's going on for Mackinson and Company. This is a huge problem for the town of Hampton. And implicit in any, any business relationship in the town of Hampton is that you don't commit fraud. I would think that's a fairly low bar. Uh, I would be prepared to make a motion that uh, that be included in any uh, RFP if you've been sanctioned by any uh, government agency, if you've been fined for fraud, that uh, you are not allowed to bid nor continue uh, to provide services of any kind to the town of Hampton. Um, that's just deplorable and it gives us all a black eye. This falls squarely on the backs of the Board of Trustees and Mr. Silberdick and we have to do their job. The Security and Exchange Commission has to do their job. Uh, now the Charitable Trust Director and the Attorney General's Office, they have to do Mr. Silberdick's job. And I will tell you, uh, in terms of core competency, uh, this isn't about uh, anything other than Mr. Silberdick's failed leadership uh, to the town of Hampton with his board. Uh, this letter talks specifically about fiduciary duties and to obey relevant New Hampshire statutes. It says the director of charitable trust will counsel and if necessary takes take actions against those trustees. You say in paragraph one, two, three, in paragraph four on page one, in light of the sanctions, trustees do have a fiduciary responsibility to review their relationship with Mackinson and company. Now, I don't know what Mr. Silberdick's uh, time hack is for how important he thinks uh, the United States government is, the Security Exchange Commission, the Attorney General's office. I think it's pretty important. And uh, I don't wait a month, and I don't keep it a secret, and I don't keep secrets from the town of Hampton. I don't keep secrets from this board, uh, and secrets are being kept, and fraud's being committed. So they have a fiduciary responsibility, and I would be interested to know um, when Mr. Mackinson or when uh, Mr. Silberdick is going to have his meeting. When will it be televised? When will we get full transparency from this? Because it's going from bad to worse, and. Uh, um, Mr. Silberdick doesn't run this town. The people in this town run this town. They should look at their returns and perhaps seek in a meeting with Mr. Mays. That point is another point that we want to know from um, Mr. Silberdick and his board. Uh, were our returns, if we had gone with some of these other firms, uh, and it will require some statistical analysis, and Mr. Mays, the new owner of the company, can pay for it because his firm was the one that was committing fraud. And we want to know, were we disadvantaged, were we left short by this fraud that was committed by this company when they secured that contract while, while this man was on the committee and the bookkeeper and the compliance officer? So that's another point we want. We want to make sure, and if you can make sure this is down here, and I'm going strictly off this letter because there's very implicit and explicit requests for information that we as selectmen of the governing body want to make sure that our taxpayers are understanding and our citizens. So we want to know, and we want a, a, a comparison between back in the day, and this is going to take a couple of minutes, Mr. Chairman, when this business was solicited, if we had gone with other firms, and what are the returns? Because as we know, there was a loss this summer of several hundred thousand dollars. And I wonder if some of these other firms that came in here didn't lose several hundred thousand dollars. And then these continued returns were on top of money that Mackinson and company didn't lose this summer. And we don't know the answer to that. 
They may also wish to consult with counsel concerning their options, which include conti continuing their relationship with Mackinson and Company. We, we do want them to consult. And when, when he's talking about that, Esquire, is he talking about you? Yes. Okay. Well, we would be interested in you meeting, I th and I think I can speak for the board on this issue, that we do want you to find out what the heck's going on and why are we continuing with this quagmire. The answer to that particular question is by contract, we, the trustees of the trust funds may disengage with Maxson and company <coughs> with minimal notice. Yeah, well, I think if it's a lot of people at this table, it, that, that minimal notice would have been um, months ago. Again, on the second page, this, this fraudulent conduct. This is the director of charitable trustees concerned with the nature of the violations that were ordered. You may also consult, and I would like us to do this, with the Bureau of Securities and Regulation. We're talking about this fact-intensive inquiry that comes down to money and will vary among municipalities. And the state cannot do this. Well, Mr. Mackinson needs to do this, and if so, we'll provide uh, um, your legal efforts to make sure that this firm does do that. Because they solicited the business, and we want to know. And if we were aggrieved, and if other firms that came in here didn't lose seven, six, seven hundred thousand dollars this summer, that's our money. That's our money, and that's a loss, and that's real money. And if other firms that came in here can demonstrate a portfolio that didn't lose money this summer, someone owes us six or seven hundred thousand dollars, whatever those losses were that were reported in the Hampton Union. Finally, um, Mr. Mackinson is, is again, he's being paid overtime. The town of Hampton, from which he steered from another vendor, business to his firm as an elected official. And I've been doing this a long time. And when I'm done, uh, when I'm 60, which is two and a half years, 41 years, I've never seen this. Never, never served the people doing this. Steered the business to himself. This is about 15% of the Mackinson Company's gross book. We are a significant, significant part of that book. And Mr. Mackinson, through his purchase contract, through his continuation as a board of director, and, and for those that don't know, a board of director runs a company. They can hire and fire chief executives. I don't know who else is a dire director. Um, would be interested in knowing when he will um, not be a, a director. Um, and we would be interested to know exactly how much he's being paid. Because it is a government contract. And it's with a public entity. And we want to know how much Mr. Mackinson has made from this fraud is stated by the New Hampshire Charitable Trust and the United States Government Security and Exchange Commission. So it goes on and on, and I'm going to wrap it up. And I said I wouldn't say anything more until I came back from Concord, but I think there's a bunch of stuff there, and you can maybe recapitulate what I just said. But um, uh, there's the, if you're doing business in town, we need to, we need to do our, our RFP, and we need to do that immediately, and I don't expect you to do it tonight. But uh, if you're convicted or, or you're fined for fraud and this, this caliber of behavior happens, you're not doing business, at least on my watch, uh, in the town of Hampton. Not, not with $21 million. Uh, and there were, there, were, there were several other things. If you can write those down and get back with the board, and this will be, again, an ongoing um, uh, challenge to the board. And uh, I, I will say directly to Mr. Silberdick, uh, based on this shadow uh, and this, this dark cloaking of information from the public. His meetings need to be televised. His minutes need to be up to speed. He needs to be more forthcoming with the people of this town, or he needs to resign. And thank you very much, Mr. Chin. Mr. Waddell. Yeah. Mr. Bean covered everything, I think. But uh, my question is, the third the fourth paragraph there, in light of the san and sanctions, trustees do have a fiduciary, fiduciary responsibility to review their investment relationship with Mackinson and Company. And I think that's an important statement. I think when they were in here that night that we had the meeting, it was stated that Mr. Mackinson had nothing to do with the company anymore. I think that I, I could be wrong, but if no, that was back sad. and check it, it was stated that he had nothing to do with the company. Now, through this letter, we find out that he's on the board of directors. So I think that raises a huge question mark. And in my mind, as I stated the last time, I just don't understand with this huge question mark why they just don't switch to a different firm. I mean, there are a lot of firms that do business that can give you the same investment return that they're getting with Mackinson and Company. I just think 
there are too many questions. And I, I agree that if, if somebody has been charged with fraud or a company has been charged with fraud, I don't think we should be doing business with that company. I think that's – I just – I don't understand. I don't understand why this letter wasn't made public by the Board of Trustees. If this letter was sent from the AG, from the Attorney General's office, why it wasn't made public. I mean, I had a lot of uh, trust in what they said that night when they were in here. I mean, they're elected officials. They're an elected board. I had a lot of trust what they said. But what they said is not what's said in the letter here. That, that raises a lot of questions. I would like to say that the Board of Selectmen has been beat up and accused many times of lack of res transparency, a lot of it from the questions that we have asked. Our questions have been answered by this letter, and we have been transparent. That, as a, as a board of five elected officials, the trustees of the trust funds, I have, uh, I feel that they will do the right thing. I have full confidence in the elected members of the trustees of the fund and I think as five, a group of five will get a good answer out of these people. Uh, so I, it's not that I don't have confidence. I do have confidence in them. Um, you know, and there are 29 other towns that have had these same problems. And I'd like to know if there's any way that you can find out um, what is the result of the other 29 towns, Mark, so that we could just use that as a... a a marker to see where we um, fit in. Um, I think because times have been good, it's unlikely that many of these towns have lost any money. Um, and if times weren't good, uh, maybe this would be a class action lawsuit. But I think times have been good, and you know, maybe it's not the case. But we'll have to, you know, maybe we can find out some more information. Personally, I do have confidence in the board, and there are five people, and they should serve the town well in the end. Any other comments? Nope. Moving on to the town manager's report. Oh. <laughs> it's been a long night, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, let us remember that today marks the anniversary of the beginning of the worst conflict in human history with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Let each of us give thanks to those who have helped secure our liberties and those who gave their full measure in that effort. Petitions for amendments to the zoning ordinance close at 5 p.m. this Wednesday. Filings that will be made at the Selectman's office before that date and time. Petitions for warrant articles other than zoning amendments close January 12th, 2016. An additional reminder to license your dog for 2015. This may be the last opportunity before you receive a court summons. See the town clerk to obtain your license. So that doesn't happen. We certainly do not want that to happen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have some other communications. I have a letter from uh, the Vincent St. Pauli Society. Uh, they are having a drive to hand out uh, coats for when men, women, and children of all shapes and sizes, and they are available to those in need. Please contact the society. They're going to uh, have a, an effort beginning on Monday, December 14, 2015, from 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. at Our Ladies. 12.30 uh, p.m.? 12.30 uh, p.m. 11.30, 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, at uh, Our Lady of the Miraculous Metal Church at... Um, the St. Vincent de Paul <coughs> building, 289 Lafayette Road, Hampton. Uh, while the White House uh, in the back of the parking lot on the right, uh, be sure to go. And if you need a coat, let them know because they're trying to uh, make sure everybody is, is taken care of for the winter. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we had a request uh, which came through the planning board. Uh, the Board of Selectmen is holding a bond. Uh, for work at 20 Keith Avenue. That was a subdivision. Mm -hmm. uh, they had um, work that needed to be done on the wetland, and the, the bond came through the Board of Selectmen. 
that uh, original planting failed. Uh, they have put in a new planting, which ap appears to be thriving at this point. Um, we did review this with the state. They have told us that the monitoring needs to go on for a period of five years. Mm -hmm. uh, the town is the one responsible should it fail and there is no bond. So the request, the, uh, the subdivider is that the entire bond be returned. Uh, I think you probably need to hold it at least until next spring to find out what's going on with the planting yeah. to see if it makes it successfully through the winter time. If it doesn't, they're required to replant the entire right. thing. And I don't think the taxpayers should pay for that. Right. I, not that I want to be mean to the developer, but um, they're supposed to guarantee this and it needs to be monitored by us and the state for a period of five years to make sure it does, in fact, continue to grow and prosper. That's a very congested area and very close to the... It the is, and, and the state is concerned because uh, there's Phragmites in that general area. If this material doesn't grow, it will have a huge stand of Phragmites growing behind this new development, which the state has told us yeah. will not happen yeah. and we would be required to clean out so up to the board whether or not you wish to refund the money to them um, it's not a big bond but mm -hmm. I believe it's five thousand uh, dollars whether you wish to hold it I'm for holding the bond I have no intention of voting to release hold it it. Hold it. Yeah. it sounds like there's a consensus to hold the bond very good we shall <laughs> well we said, shall do Mr. that Chairman. well said uh, you are probably all aware of the fact that the Executive Council, uh, through Chris Sununo, uh, has voted to include $5.9 million in construction money for work on Ocean Boulevard, something that was not expected to happen, but in fact has happened. And uh, it's always nice to see that the state um, is willing to give money to the town. <laughs> we're, we're willing to accept, that's for sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a request from the Chairman of the Budget Committee. Uh, so far we have uh, uh, honored all of their requests. This one deals with um, information on the budget of the highways, uh, parks and streets. Um, and there are two pages worth of requests that need to be responded to. Um, I don't have objection to it. I did talk to the Public Works Director today. He's out tomorrow because he had death in the family. Uh, but we'll be back on Wednesday. Uh, the committee would like to have this submitted uh, by Thursday, prior to Thursday, December 10th. I'm not sure that will be, that will happen because of the fact he's out for a funeral uh, tomorrow. But uh, with your permission, we will uh, answer, answer these questions regarding the budget for the uh, the highway department and uh, move forward unless there's an objection now and mr chairman may i in, w without stepping on your traffic there were myriad requests from both members and the chair we have a protocol those requests for information are emailed there were four or five that were made to me verbally i have no written documentation uh the professional communications and i'm happy to assist in any information request but uh, i'm not about to go back and uh look at my notes I'm not about to go back and watch two and a half hours of meetings to find out who wants what. It's a simple email. I initially requested the chair to do that. Right. Um, there were others that requested information. The professional grade communication for any corporation, large or small, is to send the email through channels from the board liaison to Mr. Welch and to you from budget to us. So uh, if you, Mr. Welch, or you, Mr. Chair, could uh, make that known to uh, Ms. Latimer. Um, then uh, you can look at what those requests are and uh, support those as you can with your up-tempo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the town manager? Mr. Waddell? No. Mr. Nope. Bridal? Mrs. Wolseley? I'll hold till under old business again. Okay. I've got a couple more things, Mr. Uh -oh. Chairman. Oh, yes, I haven't okay. finished. Sorry. <laughs> um, probably tongue-in-cheek, but uh, I just want you to know that uh, Hampton has been named the top... Oh, yeah. Beer City of the 99 beers of the 99 cities in, uh, by <laughs> livability.com. So, what is? I, how does it become the top? I have I have no idea, but I'll be happy to let you read the uh, the email that they came. It was uh, I looked at it kind of tongue in cheek, and and I thought it was a good thing to uh, to uh, to deal with. It's all Smutty Nose's fault. It well, is. You do know that um, 
uh, Hamp <coughs> or New Hampshire sells the highest amount of yeah. beer per capita yeah. yes. of any state in yeah. the Yeah, but that's because the state liquor store is on the, you know, it's, it's out of state people buying it. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think they sell beer at the liquor store. Oh, they don't, no. They don't, right. no. Yeah. Yeah. no. So I don't well, know they go and buy their groceries. Yeah. And well, they buy their groceries and buy their beer. beer yeah. Cigarettes at the uh, yeah. grocery uh, stores. Yeah. So, uh, I love out of town people <laughs> buy out of state. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, we opened bids uh, on Friday for the Ice Pond Dam. And, um, well, right we weren't very pleased at the net result. Mm -hmm. uh, the low bidder was in the uh, two hundred thousand dollar range and the high bidder was in the three hundred and eighteen thousand dollar range mm -hmm. and the appropriation was a hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars in order to in fact construct the dam uh, and and this figure is marginal i don't believe <laughs> anybody is going to bid under the three hundred eighteen thousand dollars of the high bidder at this point had made so marginally uh and i i'm going to tell you that I, I i think this figure is low that uh, we would need 350000 probably closer to $400,000 to do this dam. That's going to require a warrant article and that amount of money, which is a very big article. Um, I'm going to submit the information to you in writing. I, we're, just, we're just working on it now, um, but I have some druthers about the size of that money. It's a lot of dough, so I, I want to let you know. Also. Uh, we received a communication today that came through uh, conservation that uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has modified the permit to build the dam uh, and no construction can take place between April 15th and the end of September each year yeah. because we now have a uh, moving into into this portion of uh, uh, the United States the uh, northern long-eared bat which uh, tends to uh, hide in the bark and in the trees, uh, knots and trees and so on and so forth. And we can't cut trees any time during that period of time okay. anywhere in New Hampshire. Excellent. Well, it doesn't help us with dead trees because they hide in those too. Um, that means that uh, we have a relatively really contracted window to do the work if you decide that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Again, I will send you the warrant article so you can all read it, think about it, and um, Decide whether or not you want to do it. May I, while the press is hot, Mr. Chairman, uh, was not in support of that uh, article last year. It was a petition. We're going to be right. discussing it anyway, aren't we? Well, I just wanted we to, just, yes. just, just for an information uh, request, and when you please, because I did detailed research, uh, include the part uh, where uh, the engineers, uh, as part of that uh, analysis, uh, actually said that the beavers were doing a very good job of controlling that Absolutely. water. Well, as a matter of fact, and I, I don't know what we're paying the beavers, but it's probably with the long eared <laughs> probably the same as the long eared bat. We had an offer today to receive some beavers, surprise, surprisingly or not, uh, because they're being cleaned out of another pond in another town near here, and they need to relocate them. And, right. and I suggested they might want to talk to the Conservation Commission about positioning them in that particular yeah. pond and build a dam back for Lovely. us. It'd like be free. Beavers? The other article that we're working on is the cable uh, TV channel 22 funding. As you know, we've talked about this at the last meeting, and uh, our finance director uh, will be happy to address that issue. Um, it's going to be under old business. It's okay. That's good. We'll get to it under old business. Uh, the other thing I have is that uh, the uh, assistant town manager has completed the process for your goals and uh, I believe has distributed to each of you in your somewhere in your packets. Uh, I asked for it. That's why it's in my packet. Okay. I asked right. for a right. copy of yeah, it. Right. It's the same one that we had before, okay. Okay. I believe. All right. I'm okay. done. Okay. And so I wanted to ask. Um, now, when it comes to Phragmites, are people supposed to ever touch them themselves? Once the Phragmites go into bloom, they should be left alone because the worst thing that can happen is to shake those things and get the Spread seeds it. over everywhere. Yeah. Okay, Let them die off naturally. Um, we had started a program on Tide Mill Road right. uh, in the spring a few years ago, uh, or just before summer, of cutting back two stands of Phragmites. And we did that for two years. And we started to stunt the growth in those Phragmites. Mm -hmm. And then we were told by the state, stop. 
Uh, Why? I'm going, well, because they don't like the idea of us out there in the water cutting these things. Um, they they, they want to try some different methods to get rid of them, and, and I, I don't know. They haven't done anything. So I'm going to go back to doing that and see if we can't eradicate one of those stands because we need to do a little experimentation and this sort of thing. Uh, we're even going to try, I think, if we can get the proper permits and clearances to do some uh, Phragmite inoculation. As you know, Phragmites are... Uh, they have rhizomes and they interconnect with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we had thought of doing is injecting them um, at one end and letting it kill the whole stand right straight through with an insecticide, but we'd have to have permission from the state to do that. So we're going to try to do that. We're going to try to cut a stand and see if it, we keep it cut, whether or not it'll kill them off. Uh, but we need to start working towards that because they're getting more numerous. We just cut on hard arts way this year. I went by the guys who were chopping them down. Well, and they're already regrowing. And they've got to wow. chop them again, and then they're going to actually pull the root systems out. Yeah. And I of think course it's the obvious the Phragmites are winning. I already knew the yeah, answer are. to that question, but I thought yeah. I would ask as a, for um They're going to knowledge. poison those ones, and they're going to kill them off that way, they hope. Uh, uh, they hope. They hope. We'll see. Um, we will. <laughs> the, I, like I said, I knew the answer to that question. I just yep. wanted to bring that up. And I wanted to ask about our are people supposed to be cutting brush out around at the marsh, in the marsh area? You shouldn't or be, trees, you shouldn't you know, be anywhere out there without up. talking to the Conservation Commission. Because I hear that um, the condominium that's uh, being built right now Ooh. down at, on Ocean Boulevard, the... Oh yes, I know where it is. Yeah. The, the one that has the houses in the back. Yeah, and the, right. That they were cr uh, cutting down taking out the brush uh, behind that. That's in wetland. Well, it's what? It's in wetland, I believe. Yeah, well, it wasn't even their yard. They were doing someone else's yard. Oh, that's nice. I don't know if it was by mistake or whatever, but they were, supposedly, I hear they had to, they stopped. That, that lot was all surveyed. Kind of had to make a mistake with the surveyor sticks out there. Well, maybe that's something that needs to go to the conservation. I will talk to conservation in the morning, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I someone caught gave me that. Yeah, report. we'll check it out. Okay. Um, other questions for the town manager? Well, I've got a little about quick. his report. No. Okay. I've Moving on to old business. Number one is the cable TV distribution warn article. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, we have we're working on a draft of that. Um, the figure that we have come up with is to increase from 25 percent to 40 percent mm -hmm. yeah. of the fees to be placed in the account. And our finance director, I, I requested her to do a six-year study on what happens with that change. Oh. Because we're, we're afraid that it may deteriorate over that period of time. But as long as the expenses don't increase and we have no major breakdowns that we have to provide things for, uh, we should be all right over the six-year period without any changes or increases. All we have to do is convince Rusty to take comps. Thank you. Take what? Comps. Thank you. Well, if they go out of business, they're always anyhow. So. Oh. Wow. You're a brave woman, Christy. Well, her her analysis indicates that we'll be about between thirty and forty thousand dollars in the, in the uh, black mm -hmm. in each of the six years. Now that's, as I said, the caveat is that we don't have any major increases right. Right. and no more increases from anyone else. Right. If that happens, then we're going to have to divert more money. And like what we do when the uh, cable committee comes in to us to ask to buy equipment, the SAU 90 will be notifying us. They in give advance. us they give us a list when they request their okay. funding. Uh, the bad part of all this is is well, I'm not sure it's bad, but certainly the, the, the hurdle to be to be surmounted here is that this must be approved by town meeting. Yeah. If it is not, then we're gonna be in the position of having to cut the school off from all assistance. Ooh. So not nice. Well, I, I just I wanna point out the obvious that we don't want to get to the point of having right. a problem, right. but we need to. Uh, people need to understand that if if we're going to do something, we need mm -hmm. to do it right, 
And if we're going to continue to do something with an obligation that everybody said we should, mm -hmm. then we need to increase the fees in order to do it. Yeah. So that and we can honor our commitments. see where it's going. Yes. It's, it's very obvious where it's Not going. Not a big deal. Yeah. We'll get you a completed warrant article uh, for your next meeting, so that can then go to the, uh, if you committee. approve it, it can then go to the uh, budget, budget committee Good. for their review. Questions, no, right, Mr. Uh, Wardell? Yeah. Other towns. Sir. That fee. They put it, how much do they put in general fund? How much do they put into the, I, I think I think the answer is, I think there are some towns that put 100% of that fee into their cable TV station. There are, I, I believe that's true, but there are also some towns that put 100% of it to reduce taxes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting because Rusty's not paying anything to reduce the taxes because <laughs> he doesn't take com and What I'm saying is that the, the people who have Comcast yes. are paying to reduce the taxes for people who don't have Comcast. Yeah, and is that a legitimate uh, process to be going through? Or should it be that, that it's a cable fee, that it's a fee to go to the cable TV? That's all I'm saying. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can see it looks nice and it helps with the tax rate, but there are some people yeah. who are... I will shoot contribute to my taxes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's 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 really not a fair. Yeah, that's that's the point I want to make. Mr. Bridal, counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> Drill down. I don't have Comcast, <laughs> so I don't pay it. <laughs> Mrs. Wilson. No, I like the concept of forty percent. That's good. Mr. I like your counterpoint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, more. We'll have a completed out of article for you next week, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. So, um, moving on. No, no. Oh, we already did that business. one. Other all business. Yep. Mr. Rydell? Nothing. Mrs. Wellesley? Okay. Um, I mentioned this a couple of months ago, I think. The entry to Brad Street Road off Lock Road that had the stone. They're not revetments, but whatever the heck you want to call this, the stone head walls. That, yeah. that one on the north side is still squashed all over the place. We're going to be plowing. <coughs> it's winter. Did we ever get money out of the idiot who caused the accident? We to have just received some funds from the insurance Can company. we just not call people idiots that have well, accidents? Well, I mean, when you're doing something just like that. Just the point of order. For the person. And, who and, 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 a, and, a, uh, and a, uh, a mishap driving accident. Mishap. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it certainly was. I don't think anybody would hit one of those things on purpose. Uh, <coughs> it was the other car that got pushed into it. Well, whether it was pushed into it whichever. or not, it still whichever. wouldn't be done on purpose. Um, I'm wondering if we can it, get it rebuilt. Public Works is, in fact, working to find, then they have found someone who will, who will repair it. <coughs> and uh, they're trying to get a time and place to get that done. Yeah, because the stones are still there. And I know the people are anxious <coughs> to get that cleaned up. Yep. Nice report from the police department on Moore Avenue. Mm -hmm. I appreciated that and that will be communicated I assume to the... Well, to you'll the have it on your next agenda. Yeah, and you'll need a vote from us to do one or several of the things that they recommended, yes. I'm assuming. Very nice. Um, the ramp at Place Cove, which is no longer there. I know we're talking about ADA and we're talking about rebuilding the uh, getting engin an engineering study to rebuild the the wall, seawall up there. We really should have a ramp. Are we going to make plans maybe to get a ramp in that area? For I mean, it could be a removable wooden ramp just to get the poor people in North Beach who are there and the summer residents and stuff able to access that beach. Now, we can apply to the state again, but the last time we applied, they refused it. How can they refuse under ADA compliance? They, They're they, not concerned about ADA. They're just concerned about what the work is in the wetland. Well, to your point, was, per, perhaps Senator Stiles could uh, weigh in on this issue. Uh, well, we get a new application going. Maybe we'll send it through her. Just to go down on the sand. They're not trying to swim around. In no, the I understand that. They just want to get to the yeah. sand. So I thought I'd be a pain in the neck and bring that up again. No, that's we bring it up all the time. Oh, bless <laughs> you. Okay. This, it, it appears to me at this point, because of the presentation that Mr. DeRosier made, uh, what, a week or two weeks ago, we really need to get going on trying to get a, a Selectman-sponsored Warren article on Solar um, Solar City and, and getting solar power available 
to the town. Um, do we have a time frame? I, I look at that calendar and it looks to me like it's just flying by. Well, it is flying by and we're investigating the contract they gave us, which is not very <coughs> favorable to the town. Okay. It, it varies completely from the presentation that was made here. It also varies from the presentation of material that was presented. And I've asked counsel and he's been working on this uh, and you approved a uh, uh, special counsel to, uh, to review it who has special knowledge in solar. Um, I read the contract and I have some serious misgivings about it because the only thing that they're going to be responsible for is anything that they break Mm -hmm. or anything that they, they improperly install. Other than that, the town is responsible for it and is responsible to pay for it. Okay. Because I plead not guilty on oh, no, no, I understand. contracts. That's I, I, that's out of my... Yeah, our job is to make sure that whatever contract is presented to you okay. is one that's, at least on an equity basis, is equal for everybody. Because we're breaking very new territory here. And our concern is that, for instance, uh, there'll be, I don't, know, I, I don't remember off the top of my head how many solar panels there are up there, but right. there are a few. Right. Um, if we receive a heavy snowstorm, the panels shut off unless we go up and clean each one of them off. Solar company is going to do that. If we have a snow like last winter, you'll be making no money for months. Hmm. Well, I just... I'm not competent yeah. to figure out what's right or wrong with the contract. I'm just... We're Getting going concerned. through trying to get that done, and it may take some time to do okay. it. Okay. And let's see. Last but not least, on the uh, there, there has been some concern, and I confess I'm concerned too, about constructing warrant articles that re will result in withdrawing money to fund the purposes from the undesignated fund balance. So I just wanted to maybe refresh our memory. Um, in the, let's see, uh, our ordinances, section 611-3, uh, and this, I think, came in pretty near, either you helped with it or it I came wrote in it. pretty near, you wrote it. The balance of the unreserved, undesignated fund shall, once accumulated, at all times be no less than the balance of unpaid property taxes due to the town for municipal, school, and county, and precinct obligations as computed on December 31st of each year by the auditors plus 5% of the net adjusted appropriations of the taxes to be raised and recommended by the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Admin and calculated under general accounting standards. I'm just concerned lest we strip what is a valuable resource for us, and we've been talking about getting some rainy day fund or snowy day fund or whatever, but that fund, in my estimation, should be used as the backstop in case of a, a big disaster. I, when I talked to, um, uh, I think it was Steve Hamilton, the state recommends 7, 5%, 7%, 17%. There's a good size range there for communities to keep. So I'm concerned about drawing against that on a consistent basis. So that's something, once we get the audit, if we can sit down and take a look at it, I'd be a little more comfortable, I think, if I can get a better grip on what we, what we have. I noticed there are three in the audit for 2013. There are three designations. There's um, decrease in non uh, Spendable fund balance, there's an increase in committed fund balance, and there's an increase in assigned fund balance, and that's on page 38 of the audit. Um, and the 2013 is the only one I have. But I would just like to make sure that we're not causing problems for the town on a long-term basis by drawing too much money from that fund. So are you, you're suggesting um, 
that <clears throat> it only be done for during a disaster, a, t a major disaster? Well, I think that's a, the state, and apparently a 611 is pretty specific, and the state uh, <clears throat> intent apparently is to have two months' worth. For example, our tax, our overall tax bill for 2015 was in the neighborhood of 53 million with all the entities mm -hmm. in it. And two months' worth of that, so 12 into 53 million, you're the financial wizard. No, 12 into 53 million <laughs> is what we should have as the untouchable, I believe, um, undesignated fund balance. Well, I would I suggest that this was uh, a disaster, the snow from last year. Yeah. For us, it was a disaster. That's why we applied for disaster mm -hmm. uh, relief. relief and yeah. did not receive it. Isn't well, that correct? The, yeah, the request sure. was Didn't made early in the year when we, we still had money in the budget. Um, but just again, I think that this was sort of a disaster, as close I, as I've seen that we've had. I understand that, but what I'm saying is we're we're hoping to have two months worth of our total appropriation in a, a calendar year, our total tax appropriation uh, set aside. Well, I understand touched. that, but the thing is, you mentioned about a disaster. Yes. This was a disaster. We applied for disaster aid, and we didn't get what we, we expected. We applied early in the year when we still had money in the budget. Okay. There was some logic behind that. Yeah, well, that's the logic that I see here. Okay. Well, and uh, I think that the fund balance isn't it much higher today than it was a number of years ago, even well, now. When I came here, it was zero. Yes. Right. So it has really That's appreciated a great deal. Right, but I am concerned about well, this, drawing it's an down on, on it's it. It's an ongoing thing. You Without suggested that there doing. would be a problem if we would use it for a disaster. I say, am suggesting that that was a, a vanilla disaster. That's fine. But what I'm saying is we're talking about 2016 drawing down against that fund, and I'm not comfortable asking the voters to do that until I understand what we are sitting on now, and I guess once you get the confirmation from the auditors and so forth, we'll have a better grip on what is available to us. The state's regulation is that we have to retain, that it's a recommendation. There's not even a regulation. Right, and some towns don't do it. Some towns don't do it, and you don't have to. Right. But the, the state's recommendation is that you keep at least 5% right. of the town's appropriation not including capital outlay and not including bond issues, uh, which brings our total outlay down very substantially because we have a lot of capital outlay and we have a lot of bond issues. Um, the amount of money that um, back in 2007 that we had outstanding uh, was about $3.5 million in unpaid taxes. Now mm -hmm. it's about $1.7 million. Right. So it's substantially less. Uh, recently, and I, I, I don't remember the figure, but it was getting pretty close to 12% mm -hmm. that we had available mm -hmm. in the reserve fund versus the 5% that the state would recommend that we hold. 5 to 17%. Well, it's a recommendation. Case. Right. And uh, right. there's no statutory authority for it at right. all. But we do have the ordinance on the books. Well, no, we have a selectman's regulation. Well, Chapter 611. It's a selectman's regulation. Amount. I think he understands it where he's the one that wrote it. I just, I just want to make sure before I vote for anything that's going to be funded out of, uh, on the Warren articles, that's going to be funded out of the undesignated fund balance. I just want to understand what that undesigna undesignated fund balance amounts to and what the impact would be if we're using it to fund these various articles. Well, I guess the impact would be to give people back money they've already paid for and already held out and, and given to the town but not, but not expended for purposes for which the town appropriated funds. That's the impact. Um, the bottom line is that we're looking for something in the order of about $800,000. That's, that's what it totals up to be. Now, uh, the last, next to the last week of the month, we're probably going to have a report to the board uh, once we analyze, because right now we're doing our appropriation ledger on an almost weekly basis, yeah. uh, by the time we get two weeks from the end of the year, we're going to have a good handle 
on what's left in the, in the existing general fund, and should that be supportive enough to remove most of that eight, $700,000, $800,000, we'll be coming in to make a recommendation to the board that we, we, we spend the money for those purposes which have been delayed because of lack of appropriation mm -hmm. in prior years. As you know, we shut down the expenses to just the bare minimum we need to operate. Right. So we're not spending a lot of money right now on purpose right. because of that $350,000 for snow removal. Uh, if that works out all right, then um, nothing will, or very little will come out of surplus. In fact, uh, we probably, because revenues can't be spent, uh, we'll probably be putting in something in excess of $300,000 into the surplus account at the end of the year as opposed to withdrawing funds. So we'll probably have a net input rather than a net outtake. Mm -hmm. But that we we won't do anything until we get to the, the next to the last week of the year, uh, and and then we'll confirm that when we come back to the board right, uh, right after January one. We have until the end of January mm -hmm. to in, confirm a conference and so forth. We've already started putting things together so we can get yeah. there from here. We don't want to spend money for surplus if we don't have to, right. but we also realize that the the um, material that's requested has been deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred. And when I have a fire chief that comes to me and tells me, if somebody calls the fire station or if 911 calls the fire station with an emergency, they can't guarantee they can get the message and transmit it on. Yeah. I'm not waiting. I, I need to do something with it. And if that means we have to take money from surplus, we've got to do it. Right. I just want to be comfortable that I know, you know, I see the figures and know what we're doing. Yep. Thank you. For all business. Mr. Wendell. I just want to make a response to that, that, that and, and not a criticism necessarily, but there has been so much time spent discussing the undesignated fund with, and not trusting what was being said about it and, and not waiting to see what the results are. It's been a lot of wasted time. I'm sure that the town manager and the finance director are keeping a very close eye on that and that they're not going to go below what is recommended and what is necessary for us to keep and that uh, let's wait and s see what the final results are mm -hmm. let's wait until the audits here and see what it is mm -hmm. let's, let's wait let until we get the info and let's wait until we understand what's going on and then make some dis discussion about yeah. it let's wait and let our employees do their job mr well, enough's been said okay and <laughs> <coughs> mr um welch i would like to know Sir? i had a call <coughs> excuse me, today about uh, somebody wanting to know uh, about this, doing a Warren article. So you said it's uh, January 10th? January 12th. Is January 12th. Now, the person asked me um, this question, and I'm just going to throw it out there so that I can give okay. them some <laughs> advice, um, about <clears throat> doing a citizen's Warren article, mm -hmm. and they stress to get the conversation rolling about doing some type of a Warren article that would stop assault weapons from being sold in Hampton. So are assault weapons sold in Hampton now at some of those gun dealers that we... They all have federal licenses. They can sell them. They can sell them. That's what I thought. That's, I thought that. Yeah. Uh, so would there... Do you have anything to say about that type of a Warren article? Uh, the, uh, zoning, Mr. Gerald? There's obviously zoning as to places where mm -hmm. commercial So that's sales, more the zoning. Right. That part of it, yes. Yeah. The licensing is federal. for. So that's a federal thing. So that's something that we really wouldn't want to be getting involved in. Uh, only in regards to the place where thing, certain things are sold. The that, area that right. where they're sold. Area, yeah. mm -hmm. The area where they're sold. The and we're already covered under that? Uh, partially. Partially. and Because some of this came up last year, right? Right. For the town center districts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they can't be sold there? Um, I, I, I'd have to look and yeah, see exactly what it says. I can't quite remember either. So uh, it is a federal law, and there's not any way that an advisory warrant article Right. from the town of Hampton would have any effect. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's overridden by federal law mm -hmm. on that subject, yes. And is this the type of thing that we wouldn't really want to be getting involved in because it would leave the town open for litigation? 
I, I think there's always that potential when we delve into areas where there's another set of laws that govern. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to new business. Um, <clears throat> number one, approval of cover of the 2015 annual report. Mr. Welch. Mr. Chairman, um, the um, staff has put together a, uh, a proposal for a different type of town report this year. On the front cover, we have the old town hall, which is very nice. And then we have a selection on the back cover uh, of either two or three of the uh, views. The, the one we have upstairs at the moment has the two views down Winniconnet Road, one from uh, Whittier's Corner and the other one straight down the road uh, to the old town hall and the, uh, the church across the street. Uh, we also have one that shows... Um, Well, it shows the center of town, really. <laughs> um, and it had to be before the bandstand was built because there's no bandstand in this picture. Oh, sure. They wouldn't have been. And this is circa 1860? Yes, there. Rusty was probably here. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is before the bandstand was here. That's, that's, that's the old Ford. Depot Square. That's yeah. the old Ford, Ford deal. Yeah. Uh, I'd neat. like to have the car parked in front of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jim's riding in it. <laughs> oh, Is okay. I didn't. I didn't realize that. <laughs> I don't think I have that one. I, I also move up. that we accept the suggestion, Mr. Welch. So, That's what like is the suggestion that we use, we use these for the town old report. old photos of downtown and the, and the yeah. town hall? But I mean, so we're going to use the one of the old town hall on the front. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then which is going to be on the back? I believe it's the, it's, it's the one you this have one there, Mr. Chairman, with the two on it. And the other one would go inside, inside the cover someplace oh, or inside the report. Good. Okay, I think that's a good idea because, so this is going to be on the back? That will be on the back page, the back yeah, cover. because then it would show the front and then right. it rec give it a point of reference. Right. That's neat. Yeah. So does everyone agree with that? Yes. I, so we have a consensus for good. that. I had some pictures of the old town office with fire trucks parked in front of it, but you probably wouldn't want those. We uh, we rejected that when we figured we wanted to see it one piece. Uh, we had a picture with them, in fact, taking the, the cupola down of the building um, after the fire. And of course, there was no roof, so they just tipped it into the into the, the guts of the building because it had burned down. So, uh, but we thought it was it was. That's very uh, nice. Nice to have something to remember of the Little the original historic. community. Yeah. So. Other new business? No. Nope. New business? Mr. I Chairman, I believe our finance director has something for you. Oh, boy. Uh, I have an early Christmas. Or a late it's always nice to receive presents. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered why you were sitting over there. Looking cheery. I'm sitting over there because I have um, a draft copy of the audit for Yay. each of you. Yay! So, um... I received this Friday afternoon. Thank I have you. not gone completely through it myself. I have made it to the last page, so I have read the entire thing, but I need to go back and yeah. verify all of the numbers. Finish, finish the memorizing. Finish the memorizing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not finish the memorizing. Hopefully not. There, there you go. Christy, that's great. So basically, this is a refresher for everybody. What happens now is once you guys have the draft copy, um, in your hands, one, uh, I, will, I was hoping that we could propose that you guys have about a week to review the draft copy of the audit, gives me some time to finish going through it, and then once you guys accept uh, mm -hmm. the draft of the audit, then it can, you guys can take a vote hopefully next week right. at your meeting, right. accept, a dra accept the draft of the audit, and then um, the auditors can go forward with uh, the printing of the audit and um, getting it up on the town's website and getting the hard copies that we need to go forward. Um, and then on December 21st, if it is appropriate and okay with the board, uh, Scott Egan from Plaza Dick and Sanderson, yeah. who is the lead auditor, would like to come in and do um, an exit interview, so to speak, and go through the whole audit with the Board of Selectmen answer any questions, speak specifically on the GASB 34 yep. and GASB 45, which was also implemented um, last year. Speak uh, directly to both of those, discuss undesignated fund balance, 
um, just as a refresher course for individuals who um, need a little bit better understanding of the undesignated fund balance and then anything else that you guys uh, may like him to discuss if you let me know that he will obviously answer any questions on the spot but if there's other um, highlights that you would like him to provide then he would be happy to do so um, at your meeting on the 21st um, this can't go um, out to print or anything until after you guys have approved it so if it could be approved at the meeting on the 14th I'm sure everyone would be happy because then we can get it completed and out before the end of the year yeah. if we wait till the 21st we're kind of delaying it even a longer with the holiday Christmas in the New Year's week so um, just in time for the town report yay right and I know you guys are all tired and nobody wants to talk about the undesignated fund balance anymore but <laughs> I'm going to for two seconds I'm gonna I ask a question before you do who wins you or mr. Pierce um, I had provided to the Board of Selectmen back before the tax rate was set um, information in regards to the undesignated fund balance. The auditors have to file a form with DRA. It's called, it used to be an MS-5 and now it's an MS-535. They have to do that prior to DRA setting anyone's tax rate. It's one of those things, just like they wait mm -hmm. for things from the schools yep. and the Hampton Beach Villagers, they also have to wait for that document. At that point, even though nobody had this draft copy of the audit or it wasn't available and I was probably still working on fixed assets believe it or not at that point mm -hmm. they still had to provide that form and say this is the right. town's undesignated fund right. balance as of 12 31 14 right. and at that time and it still is it was five well it has dropped since then but it was five million fifty seven thousand five hundred and five dollars yeah. since then that was as of 12 31 14. Yep. There was a Warren article that took $400,000, article number 38. I have made note of that. And um, it was also noted when the tax rate was set, took $400,000 from the undesignated fund balance. Took so it brought it down to $5,057,505. Yeah. The board then took a vote to use $500,000 right. right. of the undesignated fund balance to offset taxes so after all of that was done the undesignated fund balance is four million five hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred and five dollars so four point five is the number that Fred and I have both been throwing out here and there but it is actually four million five hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred and five dollars um what more than zero it is more than zero and I think that the only time the undesignated fund balance is 100 percent firm is on that day when the auditors right. declare it yeah. and so when we had that yep. form it was declared and then you know um, as the finance director I can tell you you know we've done this and we've done that but we also know that Fred just pointed out that we're probably going to be three hundred thousand dollars to the good for revenues at the end of the year right. that becomes part of the undesignated fund balance mm -hmm. but I can't tell you that it's included in the undesignated fund balance right now yeah. because I don't have that authority to do so but and the expenditures, if there's any money left there, also will go right. to the undesignated fund balance. So just for clarification, as of right now, we know that it is $4,557,505. And of course, when the audit was done, it was the um, higher number, the 5057505 Would you like to respond to anything about the budget committee? No, I think everyone is very tired. And I <laughs> well said. all of the support I received from this board, and I will just leave it at that. I just wanted to clarify that um, and give you guys all the draft audit so that hopefully at your meeting next week, um, if you would like me to come, I can come. If not, Fred could hopefully get you guys to vote on that. Um, and then on the 21st, um, Scott has already committed to coming down and he's more than welcome to he's welcome happy to come here every single year and he wishes that he would be invited every year and I told him as long as I'm the finance director I will invite him <laughs> and for your first year you do a great job I thank will you. have to say Mr. I, what, I would uh, like to just say thank you very much for all the work you've done and for a great report and I'm just amazed that you know what you're doing <laughs> and it just amazes me that you can say what the figures are and you can tell us what they are and that you know what you're doing. That is an amazing feat. And I wish other people in the town would recognize that. Or I think most people do. Other boards would recognize that. 
Thank you. We're all working together. Thank you very oh, much. Wait, one second before she goes. Yep. Yeah, when I was talking to Scott Egan, who was, who was very gracious last week, he certainly commended you on what you're doing, but he, I, I asked him if when he comes in he could delineate the GASB situation so the public can understand right. why we need to do these general accounting measures. And he's pretty promised that right. he would. And I believe that when Mr. Bean um, reviewed in the audit, I, for, I believe for a couple of years it was just an opinion, and then I think it had gotten to the point of being mm -hmm. an adverse opinion right. in the 2013 yes. audit. In adverse opinions, which Scott will Doesn't go through because I'm not an auditor, but right. when he comes in, those are the worst opinions that yeah. you can receive in an audit. And we're not so they're paying, not ones that you like to have. So. We're not paying well, auditors to do adverse opinions. It had been in there in the audit for several years, I believe, as just oh, ten a, years, a regular Christy. opinion or so, but then it became an adverse opinion, I yeah, believe, right. for the first yeah. time in 13. It may have been sooner than that. Which affects so. the amount we can borrow for bonds. Oh, yes. And the big joke upstairs is that Two other finance directors were smart enough to dodge the bullet, but I got hit with it. So. <laughs> but I survived, because here I am. Good job. Well, Christy, there's no sense in paying auditors if you don't take yeah. their advice. Yeah, it's an audit. Yeah. Yeah. I say we're a bulletproof vest. Okay. I'll get one of those from Richie tomorrow morning, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Very Thank nice. You, Thanks, Christy. Well, that's uh, a relief. <clears throat> Next year should be much faster. Closing comments? Right. Oh. I just need to chat with the board afterwards. Chat. Okay. chat. We're going to have a chat. That sounds All right. <laughs> Is there um, 2115? Legal term. Second. All those in favor, unanimous. <laughs> Max. Yeah. Did you want a copy of that letter? Oh, I already have it.